Hi, welcome to the next of our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. Today we're going to be talking about Maxwell's equations and some of the effects that happen when we allow electric and magnetic fields to change in time. Um, if you're in my class, this is sort of covered in the start of Chapter 7, but I'm going to do a qualitative explanation that I hope will explain and help make sense out of some of the things that are going to come later. Um, and it's, it's not really covered in your textbook. I apologize if you hear a lot of noise in the background, but I'm down in Florida as I'm recording this, and there's a big thunderstorm going on and a lot of wind, and uh, that's some of the noise that you may hear in the background. So as we covered a couple lectures ago, it turns out that when you la allow electric and magnetic fields to change, a lot of the relations we derive between charge, fields, and voltage, and between currents, magnetic fields, and vector potential don't hold anymore, and in fact you can reduce the equations you really need to do calculations in electromagnetic down to only four. And these four are called Maxwell's equations. And you shouldn't really think that Maxwell derived four equations. It turned out that it took uh, Maxwell many, many years to figure out these equations. Um, and he started with 12 equations and gradually, at, over you know, a period of probably more than 10 years, realized he only needed four. And in order to figure this out, he actually had to construct little mechanical models of wooden wheels and gears and little cranks that turned uh, to figure all of this stuff out because that's the way they figured out stuff back in those days about a hundred years ago. So of all the equations that we derived before we're going to keep four and I've basically expressed these four in differential form um, and if I can spell differential it would help um, and differential form means that they're expressed as derivatives. On the next screen, uh, we'll see in a minute that you can also express these in integral form. But in differential forms, Maxwell's equations are Gauss's law. In other words, the divergence of the electric flux is equal to the charge enclosed within any region, uh, the sources and sinks. We've covered this before. Uh, the second is the divergence of the magnetic flux is equal to zero, which, as we saw, means there is no such thing as a magnetic charge. The third one is the curl of elect the electric field is equal to the rate of change of the magnetic flux. This is just Faraday's law. Um, and we're going to ex be exploring this equation in just a little bit. And the fourth one, essentially, is Ampere's law that says the curl of the magnetic field is equal to the conduction current plus the displacement current that we learned about in the last lecture. And as I mentioned, Maxwell's equations can be expressed in both differential form involving derivatives and integral form involving integrals. Um, this is the integral form of Gauss's law. This is the no magnetic charge rule in integral form. Faraday's law, as we saw earlier, can be expressed in um, integral form this way. And similarly, um, Ampere's law is expressed in this way that just says that the uh, magnetic field around a loop is equal to the current enclosed plus the rate of change of the magnetic flux through the loop. And so you might think there are actually eight Maxwell's equations, but really there are four, because uh, whether you express it with derivatives or with integrals, um, the equations essentially mean the same thing. Gauss's law and derivative integral form is just Gauss's law. So why do we have two forms? It turns out that if you're calculating fields over a region, so you know the field over a region, you know the current distribution over a region, you know the charge distribution over a region, that the differential form makes a lot of sense. You have to know how things change over a region or over time in order to even be able to calculate a uh, derivative. Something defined at just a point, you can't use a derivative to calculate with. On the other hand, if you have um, point charges, if you have well-defined structures like loops or arcs or lines, it turns out that the integral forms of Maxwell's equations make a lot more sense to do calculations. So it's not like one is right and one is wrong. You use the form that makes the most sense. It turns out, actually, that a lot of these calculations anymore are done on a computer. And it turns out that for many, many types of problems, the derivative form is a lot more useful for computers to calculate things because computers are very good about calculating things over a region. However, remember, derivatives aren't defined when you have discontinuities, edges and points and things like that. And so in that case, even computer algorithms often use the integral forms. So again, you use the form that makes sense for the problem you're trying to solve. So we're going to have plenty of time to become intimately acquainted with Maxwell's equations in a more mathematical form, but I want to spend a little bit of time in this online lecture to really talk about what these equations mean 
because it turns out that the meaning of these equations is, is actually kind of difficult if you just start from a mathematical perspective. So I want to give you maybe more of a qualitative perspective. And so, so what we're going to do is we're going to basically set up another thought experiment and think about maybe some of the things that could arise from Maxwell's equations from this thought experiment before we go into some of the more mathematical formalism. So essentially what we're going to do is we have some kind of voltage source right here and we're going to have a switch in our circuit and we're going to close this switch which is right here at time t equals zero and of course when we do essentially the current's going to flow along the wire because over here we have one plate and think of it as one plate of a parallel plate capacitor so this little black region up here represents a place where the current that comes into this wire gets distributed and can flow down this plate very, very evenly. So we're going to have essentially a giant sheet of current that we're going to turn on at time t equals zero. And of course, then this bottom region on the bottom is going to collect the current and flow it back into the voltage source. And so essentially what we're going to do is we're simply going to turn on a giant sheet of current at time t equals zero. And we're going to look at this giant sheet of current from two perspectives. The first perspective we're going to look at is a side view and we're going to have essentially one black line and this black line represents that sheet of current and it's going to be basically being viewed from the side we're also going to look at a top view of this giant sheet of current um, from this perspective right here and we'll have a second black line essentially for what that top view and I'll, I'll basically put top view and side view on these black lines so you can keep track of what is what the region, reason we're going to assume a giant plate is we want to be able to, just like in the parallel plate capacitor analogy, neglect edge effects. We want to have really, really uniform fields. So we're going to be looking at, a cent at the center of this plate, where it's so far from the edges, we can essentially ignore what's going on. And essentially what we're going to see is that, that when you turn this sheet of current on, the things are going to move. And remember that electric and magnetic fields don't go from place to place instantaneously. In, in Maxwell's times, it turns out they thought that they did, that you could have action at a distance. Um, and one of the things Maxwell was interested in, along with Faraday, was showing that action at a distance made no sense. Um, and remember that in vacuum or free space, the fastest things can go is about um, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. This is C, the speed of light. And remember when we were studying transmission lines, we pointed out that this corresponds to moving about one foot in a nanosecond, or a billionth of a second. And that corresponds to a frequency of about a gigahertz. So you can think about, you know, with a one gigahertz clock rate on a computer, all the pulses have moved about a foot if they've moved about the speed of light by the time the clock clicks over again. So this actually, on modern day speeds, is really um, not that fast a speed. It's the fastest things can go, but it's a manageable amount of time and a manageable amount of space. So let's take a look at what's going to happen when we flip that switch and turn the current on. Well, we know from our top view that we're going to have a current, and the current's going to be rushing down um, into the screen, and so basically we'll, we'll put our physics symbol for things going down right there. Um, on our side view, our current's going to be rushing down that direction, so we'll label the current going that way. Now, we also know that whenever we have a current going through something, and remember this current's um, actually inside the sheet, not to the side as I've drawn it, but, but a current's going to create a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is going to surround the current. That's Ampere's law right there. And I can uh, take the right-hand rule and point my thumb into the screen on the top view and see that, in fact, the magnetic field is going to go around this way. And so this sheet of current is going to create a magnetic field that goes around the sheet of current in the clockwise direction. And notice that I'm labeling magnetic fluxes and magnetic fields in green, while I'm uh, labeling electric fluxes and electric fields in blue, just so we can keep these two things straight here. Well, in our side view, what's going to happen? Well, essentially, if, again, if I do the right-hand rule, point my thumb down toward the bottom of the screen, rotate my fingers around, you're going to see that the magnetic field is pointing out of the screen toward you on the side view over here and on the other side um, the magnetic field is going to be going into the screen and this essentially just corresponds to the uh, side view of the top view that essentially you see over on the other side and one thing that's very important to keep in mind because this really is the argument we're putting together here is that as soon as this current turns on the magnetic field doesn't spring up everywhere in space in fact it starts very close to the wire and propagates out away from 
the sheet. It looks like a wire, but it's really a sheet of charge here, with some velocity v, which we think is the speed of light, but we haven't yet proven that. And again, uh, the magnetic field is essentially going to propagate away with some velocity v. So let's take a look on the next slide uh, what that velocity says to us if we understand Maxwell's equations and we understand time-varying electric and magnetic fields. So this is the same picture, but I've drawn things a little bit differently now, just so uh, the point I'm going to make is going to be a little clearer. You notice over here on the left-hand side at the bottom we have Maxwell's equations in the differential form, while over here on the bottom at the right-hand side we have Maxwell's equations in their integral form. And the ones I'm concerned about have to do with relationships between electric and magnetic fields here. There are other ones of Maxwell's equations I haven't written down. So let's first look over on the left-hand side of the screen at the, the differential formulation of Maxwell's equations. Well, we know we can ignore the first term, sigma e, because in free space, as we've situated our, our sheet of, of conducting, that's conducting material that's carrying our current, the conductivity of vacuum or air is equal to zero. So, so this term essentially goes away. That simplifies. So let's just cross it out so we can forget about it. We know, however, on the left-hand side of the equation, we have the curl, del cross h, the curl of the magnetic field. And remember, our curl means that we put a paddle wheel somewhere in our magnetic field. And the direction that paddle wheel spins, if it spins at all, um, is essentially equal to the curl. Well, if I put a paddle wheel like this in it, so let's draw our little paddle wheel this way, and let's put our little paddles out on it, um, we know that the magnetic field is going to get weaker and weaker as we move away from the current sheet, because that's what magnetic fields do. Um, and I've drawn this as very thick green lines close to the current sheet, and thinner and thinner green lines as you go away. So you can make a mental picture that what's going to happen is this side of the paddle wheel is going to feel a strong force, this side of the paddle wheel is going to feel a weak force, and essentially your paddle wheel is going to spin around in the counterclockwise direction. So what does that mean? That means that this current that has suddenly turned on has created a magnetic field, and the magnetic field is moving in that direction, but it is also essentially has a curl to it, has a spatial variation, and the curl essentially points up out of the screen at you. Again, I'm taking my right hand, moving my fingers in the direction the paddle wheel is turning, and I find the thumb is pointed up out of the screen at me. So essentially what that means is that the curl is non-zero and it's pointed up out of the screen at you. Um, this means essentially, because of the equal sign, the fact that if Maxwell's equations tell us that if there is a curl to a magnetic field, we must have a time-changing electric flux. Again, since the curl is not equal to zero, the magnetic field that's spatially changing has created an electric field that's changing in time. This is a little bit easier to understand, perhaps, if we look at the integral equations over on the right-hand side here. So let's, let's redevelop this picture using the integral equations and understand how both can be used. Well, the integral equations of Maxwell's equations over here at the bottom of the right-hand side essentially say that if I sum up the electric field around some closed loop, that's equal to the time rate of change of the flux, the magnetic flux, through the surface that that loop makes. And so what I've done is I've drawn essentially a, a dashed line over here. You can see it right here. That's going to be my loop. And the surface, ds, is just the area inside the loop. Well, we know we've created a magnetic flux when we turned our current on right here, and that's drawn essentially as the little uh, green arrows. We know that the magnetic flux on the side I've drawn the loop is coming out of the screen at you. And um, we know essentially that that flux is just the value times the loop. But is it changing in time? The answer to that question is yes, because remember, if we think about this current just turning on, the magnetic flux is propagating out in that direction. So these green circles haven't yet moved out to the end of the loop. They're only in the area shown because there hasn't been enough time for the magnetic field to propagate out yet. Well, recognizing this, it's actually pretty easy to calculate the rate of change of the magnetic flux. Essentially what it's going to be is it's going to be the value of the um, magnetic flux, B, that's induced, uh, times the rate of change of the flux through the area. Well, given that uh, one side of this square is L, 
that gives us um, one length. The other length essentially is how far that distance is, essentially how far the flux has moved. And so we can write the, the area as L times the velocity, because the velocity essentially, essentially tells us that change delta x in some time delta t. And so that velocity is the rate of change of the area. So again, this integral right here, we can represent in a very simple form as the strength of the magnetic flux times the vertical length of the loop right here, we call L, and the velocity v, that flux is moving outward from the time we turned on the current. What about the left side of the integral over here? Well, that's pretty straightforward. We know the only parts of this line integral that are going to contribute are the parts where there's actually a magnetic field. So all of this stuff out here where the magnetic field hasn't come yet isn't going to contribute to that. We know this side and this side, because we're integrating in opposite directions, are going to cancel out. And so the only part that's going to contribute is this. So the way you write it is you basically say the value of the electric field times L is equal to the value of the magnetic flux times L, the, the vertical length of the loop, times the change of velocity. So let's remember that and move on. We'll come back to this in a minute. So on the last slide, we saw that when we turned the current on, we essentially created a, a magnetic field around the loop, which I've shown essentially as a loop here from our top view. Or if we look at the side view of our, our metal plate that's carrying the current, we see the magnetic fields coming out of the screen at us here and into the screen here. We also saw that what happened is because the magnetic field was getting weaker in space as we moved away from it, and because it was propagating, it gave rise to an electric field, which I've shown in blue here. On this side, the electric field is pointing up. Um, on the other side here, the electric field is seen pointing up here and pointing down on this side of the screen, because Maxwell's equations say that a spatially changing magnetic field gives rise to a temporarily changing electric field or electric flux vector. And we also saw that there was a relationship between the electric field and the magnetic flux vector that we could tie into um, by basically looking at the flux through a surface and the uh, line integral of the electric field around uh, a loop that the electric field is equal to the magnetic flux times the velocity if we cancel out the size of our loop L. And you can see as we go forward that L is going to cancel. It turns out that the same thing happens if you start to look at the other one of Maxwell's equations that relates electric and magnetic, electric and magnetic fields that are changing in time. And um, the integral form this time I've shown down here on the right side and the differential form I've shown on the left side. So these equations are the same. They're just the two different forms. Let's look at the differential form over on the right side first. Um, again, we make our paddle wheel argument. So we draw a little paddle wheel in the electric field that was created by the time-changing magnetic field from our last slide. Um, and we see that in this case, there's going to be a stronger force pushing up that way than there is um, on that side of the paddle wheel. And again, we would expect our paddle wheel to move in that direction. Um, again, if I take the, the argument of, of sticking my thumb down into the board and moving my fingers or, or into the screen and moving my fingers around, I can see that essentially um, what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the creation of a magnetic field. I can see that what's going to happen is this uh, spatially varying electric field given by this term in Maxwell's equations is going to create a time varying magnetic flux or magnetic field and that the direction um, by using the right hand rule is essentially going to be the same. So what's happened here? Um, from the differential equations we know that when we turn the current on we create a magnetic field. Um, the spatial variation of that magnetic field creates a time varying electric field. Um, the spatial variation of that electric field creates a time-varying magnetic field. So these fields create one another. Let's see if we can understand this in a different way by using the integral equations over here on the left-hand side of the screen. Here we do pretty much our same argument as last time, so I'm not going to go into it in as much detail. Uh, because there's nothing to conduct electricity in free space, we can ignore any kind of current that flows, so we simplify it that way. And we say that the magnetic field around the closed loop is equal to the time change of the electric flux through the loop. Um, we know essentially that our electric field is going to be propagating outward with the velocity v in this direction. We don't know what v is yet, but we, we kind of think it's going to be the speed of light. Um, 
And so the time rate of change of the electric flux through the surface is basically just going to be, as in the last case, uh, d times the velocity times the length L here of the loop. By the same argument we made last time, that there essentially is no magnetic field or no electric field that's generated a magnetic field out here, we can ignore this part of the loop. This part and this part cancel out since the integrals are going the opposite direction. And so the only part that contributes is this part of our square loop right here. So essentially what we can write is we can say that the magnetic field times that loop is equal to the electric flux times the velocity times L. And now essentially what we've got is we've got two different equations um, that relate um, magnetic field to electric flux and electric field to magnetic flux. Let's draw lines between them. Um, in both equations, we can cancel those values of L out because they appear on both sides. And so let's do an analysis of these equations really quickly and see what they tell us. So one more quick run through. We have a circuit. We close a switch at time t equals zero. And we run current through a giant sheet of conductor. From the top view of that sheet, the current is going to go down into your screen. And it's going to look like that. So let's draw it like that. Uh, from the side view, the current's going to flow down in that direction, and so we'll label that I. We know that that current is going to create a magnetic field, which, due to the right-hand rule, is going to go around this way, looking from the top or from the side. Essentially, it's going to be coming out of the board at you on this side of the screen, and into the board or into the screen over on this side of the sheet of current. Maxwell's equations then tell us that the spatially or time-varying magnetic field is going to create an electric field that's going to be pointing up over here and down over here in our side view, or it's essentially going to be pointing up at you over here from our top view, down on the other side. Because this field in turn is changing in time and propagating, we're going to get another magnetic field. This new magnetic field essentially is going to give rise to another electric field, and so on and so forth. Now, there's a big misconception I've introduced here, uh, quite by accident, which is that electric and magnetic fields are sort of stacked like layers on a cake. You have one region in space that has a magnetic field, another region that has an electric field, and you sort of, you sort of go from magnetic to electric regions. This is not true. This is happening not in terms of discrete sort of layers as I've drawn here, but it's continually happening in time. Electric fields that change in time give rise to magnetic fields, which give rise to electric fields, which give rise to magnetic fields. And so this really is a continuous rather than a discrete change. But in order to understand this in more details, we actually have to dive into using uh, Maxwell's equations in a more mathematical sense and figure out um, how we might possibly describe these changing in electric magnetic fields in a way that's somewhat mathematically rigorous. And that's going to be the topic of the next lecture or two. Well, essentially what we have here is we have an expression for the magnetic field in terms of the electric flux and the velocity, the electric field in terms of the magnetic flux and the velocity, and this is just a simplified case of, of Maxwell's equations when we had our very large sheet of charge. Of course, we can expand our electric flux vector and write the electric field and magnetic field in terms of each other, and also the electric field and magnetic field in terms of each other. And so we have both, we have two equations, and they both we think are going to be true. And we can essentially resolve this just by taking this equation and substituting it in for the value E here. So let's see what we get. Well, when we do that substitution, we come up with this equation right here. We see we can cancel H from each side of the equation, uh, which essentially just reduces over here. And that's a fairly simple algebra problem, essentially. And what we can find is that the velocity now is given in terms of mu and epsilon. And this is interesting because, remember, we have values from mu and epsilon. Uh, mu naught in free space, which is where we did our problem, is equal to 4 pi times 10 to the minus 7 henrys per meter. And we remember epsilon naught, the permittivity of free space, is equal to 8.85 times 10 to the minus 12 farads per meter. And if you take a calculator and you plug this in, 
you in fact find that V is equal to about 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, which is the speed of light. And so what have we just discovered here? We've done a really simple problem where we've looked at a giant sheet of current. We've looked at how Maxwell's equations very qualitatively can talk about the changes in the electric field. And from this and some really simple integrals in geometry, we've essentially determined we can figure out what the speed of propagation is, and it turns out to be the speed of light, exactly as we'd expect.